Good morning, good afternoon, and hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Overcoming Barriers to Productivity in HCS, an Image to Answer Solution for Biologists. I'm Alexis Krause of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Cytiva. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their website at Cytiva.com. So let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenters, William Marshall, Senior Product Manager at Cellular Analysis Cytiva, and Dr. David Egan, CEO and Co-Founder, Core Life Analytics. For a complete biography on both of our presenters, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Will, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Will Marshall. I'm a Senior Product Manager at Cytiva, responsible for the High Content Screening Portfolio. Very excited today to be presenting on the topic of overcoming barriers to productivity and high content screening. As a reminder, it's a joint webinar where we'll be presenting the first half of the talk and then handing it over to our friends at Core Life Analytics for the second portion of the session. Today's talk is about overcoming some of the challenges, bottlenecks, pain points in the high content screening workflow. But before we jump into that, let's, let's back up a bit and look at what that workflow is. So at its core, it's nothing more than automated microscopy. So the acquisition stage is where you're acquiring many, many pictures and micro tatter plates of many, many samples. And it's far more images than you could ever afford time to look at and make sense of if you're trying to understand, for example, an efficacious drug to rescue some diseased phenotype. So we need algorithms and computers to come in and help us with methods like object segmentation. So we want to find single cells in an image and we want to extract features from those or measurements. We use those terms interchangeably. And then we want to take those measurements or features into an analysis step where we use statistical methods to try to make sense and draw conclusions and actionable insights from the images. So another way to, to break this down that's a little bit less granular even is, is into two parts, image analysis and downstream analysis. In image analysis, we're really just converting that information in the pixels into a more structured format that's more friendly to applying these statistical analyses. And then the job of the downstream analysis is really to take all that very high dimensional data, reduce it down to something that we can interpret and understand to draw a conclusion and move on to the next step in our research project. And if we go back and look at the first example, from the actual patent for high content analysis, we, we actually see that it's actually quite low content. So it's nothing more than a true nuclear translocation assay, which is very valuable in itself. But it's a pretty simplistic way to look at how biology responds to things like small molecule perturbation or genetic modifications. So if we flash forward to today, this is much more representative of what people are doing with respect to high content screening. And it's much more comprehensive when it comes to understanding and describing a phenotype. It's leveraging all the content in the image as opposed to just a single feature like where is the intensity? Is it in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm? Instead of extracting one feature or taking a ratio of some different measurements, it's very high content. In fact, we're extracting thousands of features for every cell within an image. And it doesn't require that we know what the target is for a drug. It doesn't require that we understand fully the function of a gene. It's simply looking for differences between two different conditions by leveraging all the information-rich content that you see in a picture. So 
kind of what, what sets the stage for the rest of the talk is that assay complexity is continually increasing. And as you extract more and more information from, from an individual cell, the data becomes overwhelming. So what are we going to do with this? How are we going to make sense of all this, this information, distill it down to something that's actionable? Well, it's very hard using our current methods. We've outgrown the capabilities of these methods. So can we look for a new technology, something that's inherently good at solving these types of problems? And machine learning is actually capable of doing exactly that. So this is from a review article, and I show three different examples. And we start with a figure on the left. So using machine learning, this group was able to do some hierarchical clustering on the phenotypic profiles, extracting all this content-rich information from individual cells in a, in a massive high-content screen, and then perform the same type of clustering method on the chemical compound structures and the different features associated with those structures. And what they see is strong correlation between the phenotypic profiles and the clusters that are representing chemical compounds with similar structures. So what this means is the chemical structure is very predictive of the phenotype it will generate when you put it into cells. In the interest of time, I won't go through all the possibilities this creates, but you can imagine um, what this means for being able to understand what is a subset of molecules that might be efficacious against some disease state. And in the center example, we're looking at a supervised machine learning object classification example where the researchers have set up an RNA eye screen to understand the function of certain genes that have an unknown function. And what they see whenever they group these cells um, very accurately by their phenotype is that the functions of the genes that drive the generation of these phenotypes cluster together. So what that means is if you have an, a gene with an unknown function, but you have other genes with a known function, you can use this phenotypic readout to then infer something about that gene with an unknown function, which is quite powerful. And all of this in the first two examples only works because of the ability to use all the content in an image to describe the phenotype. Take a look at example three. This is using deep convolutional neural networks, which is a form of machine learning that has the advantage especially with images, that it learns the features that are the most important. So those were just three examples. On the left, I show some bullet points of all the different places where people are using different types of machine learning methods to improve different steps in the high content screening workflow that you see on the right. And if there are so many options, it can kind of be overwhelming as to where do we start. And at Cytiva, my team and I really look for where we can make the biggest impact. We start there and see where to go next. So we've settled on one kind of concept that kind of guides us, and that's high content screening is about leveraging the most content possible and then making sure that content is of some degree of quality before we go into the downstream analysis step. So let's first start with uh, some more examples on improving our ability to leverage content, and we'll focus on a truly phenotypic analysis. So let's take a look at a typical classification workflow. Classification being how we divide up the data set into subpopulations based on the phenotype. So this is an example of, let's say, current state or the way that people have performed a classification step in the recent years. So it's very similar to what you might be familiar with with flow cytometry. You take a single feature like the intensity of objects as it passes through the laser beam and you can generate tons of different data points very quickly. So you have a lot of data to work with and then on a scatter plot or on a histogram as I show here, the job is to add gates to that plot and segregate these different subpopulations. But this requires the user to select the right features from an image that actually describe this more complex phenotype than just the intensity. And you have to apply all of these things in the right logical order if you're building some complicated decision tree as the problem gets harder. 
Then at each step in this, you have to threshold on these different histograms or on, on your scatter plot. And this can be somewhat of an arbitrary process. If I move that threshold left or right a little bit, does it actually change the end result? So inherently it's low content. That's, that's the real problem with it. And as we increase the content to describe the phenotypic or the phenotype accurately, it starts to become unmanageable for a person. It, it's too many dimensions in the data set. So let's, let's switch this figure up. And, and, and draw it up as if we use some machine learning. So the interaction between the human and the analysis problem is much different, as opposed to having to worry about the logic, what measurements are correct, and where to set those thresholds. We leave that problem to the computer. And instead, we just give it examples of a class of a cell, and then another class. And it figures out how to differentiate between those classes. So the computer is learning the most appropriate features, and it has the extra advantage that it can learn the right combination of the features, which is something that's quite challenging for a human. It's a data-driven approach, meaning that statistics help guide us on where that threshold can be. And statistics work the way that they work. They, they're not biased to the same kind of considerations that humans are. And it's high content. So as the problem gets increasingly harder, and it becomes much more difficult than just separating these interface and metaphase cells, um, the, the method can keep up with the complexity if it has the right features fed into it. So at Cytiva, we, we built our own version of a trainable classifier, object-level classifier. It's called Phenoglyphs. It's a module in our Encarta image analysis software. And just like I described, it, it has the same benefits of a machine learning-based classifier. But we've added on our extra spin to it, which is we start with an unsupervised step. So it becomes even more inherently unbiased. The first step is to just let the computer find natural patch, uh, patterns in the data and return that to the user. So it breaks up the data set into groups of things that look visually similar. And then you tell the machine if it did a good job or not. You're not even clicking on individual cells, you're just rewarding the computer when it did a good job, and you're penalizing it when it did a bad job. And it's an iterative process where it learns a classification model based on the features that it was given until you confirm that it's accurate. And because it's using all of the measurements and all of the descriptive features to des describe the phenotype, it's much more sensitive to resolve subtle phenotypic differences. So when we put this in practice in the field, um, we were not disappointed. Um, this is a collaboration from several years ago with Galapagos. It's a biotech in the Netherlands where they were looking at finding drug targets to come up with therapies for systematic sclerosis. And they want to generate a high content screen in these diseased human, cell, uh, human skin cell fibroblasts. And they know from the literature the fibroblast to myofibroblast transition is potentially very important in understanding this disease. On the right, in the top figure, I show the image. It's quite complex. It's multiple fluorescent markers, so there's a ton of content to leverage. Okay. So again, back to the content that we can take advantage of to understand what happens whenever we use an sRNA, for example, to knock out a gene. If the cells look the same, then probably that's not an important gene involved in the pathway involved in this FMT transition, okay? But if we do get some kind of change, whether it be very strong or subtle, then that might be a gene of importance. So on the bottom right, I show how they array their controls. And for the purposes of this talk, let's divide it into two groups, the non-treated group and the treated group. Treated group being the blue uh, and the red wells, the green being the non-treated wells. And now I want to draw your attention to the heat maps that we show here. So it's comparing two methods. It's what happens when we take a conventional method where we use one feature to try to predict whether or not a siRNA treatment knocks out a gene and whether that gene is implicated in this process that generates a phenotype. And it's pretty noisy. Maybe you can see the hint of the controls standing out from the background, but basically it's noise. If you look at the heat map on the left, 
This is from phenoglyphs, where it's using all the content in an image to say, do you really look like a non-treated cell or do you look like you know, something else? And you can clearly see that the controls are well separated from the rest of the population. And you start to see hints of wells that are somewhere in between. So those are your, your targets for potential hits. And when they do that hit analysis on this uh, pilot study, they find that actually both methods give you 1.5% hit rate, but they don't agree on what the hits are, which makes you ask the question, which method do you trust? We already have an indication from the heat maps that the phenotypic approach might work better than the simple univariate uh, hit scoring. But if we take a look at something like a statistical metric that tells us the confidence or the robustness of our assay like a Z prime, then it becomes much more clear. So the orange bars represent the Z prime values from the single univariate feature-based method, the intensity scoring method, and the green represent the result when they use phenoglyphs to capture much more information and bring that into the analysis. And you see that the Z prime increases by at least a factor of two. So I'll stop here on leveraging content and we'll go upstream in the workflow now and we'll talk about the features that go in to something like a machine learning classifier. So segmentation is the first step. So reliable quantitative data is vital for every downstream step in that workflow, segmentation being the first. If you have errors that are going to propagate through the rest of your analysis, some degree of error is okay. It's going to happen. Segmentation is a very challenging problem and ultimately there is no right answer. But at some point, like in the phenoglyphs example I showed earlier, you get to a point where the error adds up or the method doesn't stand up to the complexity of the assay and you start to miss things that are very important and that we would obviously see with our eyes and our brain if we had time to actually as a human go in and look at all the pictures that we generate. And why is it challenging? Well, in microscope images of cells or tissues, objects are crowded. It's a complex image. They have different sizes and shapes. We're often struggling from poor signal to noise. Biomarkers, fluorescent biomarkers aren't perfect. We have low contrast and we're resolution limited. Not to mention we have high phenotypic variability. This can come from the perturbations we're adding to the sample, like drugs, or it can just be natural heterogeneity in the cell type itself. And that's a problem for signal processing methods. They are built to focus on one structure and they're really biased by some prior information about what that structure should look like. So what happens? So these traditional signal processing methods are inherently now in the context of the types of research we're doing today, unreliable, they're unflexible, and they're inaccessible. If they're unreliable, that means you're, you're getting garbage out of your image analysis. And that's going to go into your downstream analysis where ultimately you draw a conclusion. So the robustness and sensitivity of your assay is going to be reduced. They're inflexible. You're probably not working on one experiment in your lab. You might be working in different biological models. You might be working on different types of experiments to perturb those individual samples, and they're going to look different. If your algorithms are not flexible enough to handle that variation, you're going to have a limitation there. So what do people do? They go get numerous software tools. They get uh, custom coding is, is another way to solve the problem, but that makes it inaccessible. And when you get to the level where you have to be a programmer, you're no longer focused on your biology. Okay, so it's about where do you invest your time. So. Is there a way that we can solve all three of these kind of different um, problems in the workflow, in the segmentation piece at least, um, in one shot? And deep learning was something we were very interested in, and we built a product around it, and we're very happy with how it's turned out. So it's another module for Encarta software. It's called SYNAP, which is an acronym for segmentation is not a problem. It works with any type of data. It's highly flexible, including Brightfield, which is always a challenge for signal processing methods. It's high accuracy. It maintains that even when things are low signal to noise, when objects are tightly packed and clumped. It's not sensitive, uh, sensitive to the phenotypic variability, which is a very important thing given that's what you're trying to study. 
and it doesn't require any image analysis expertise. Unlike these more simplistic methods, where you have to be an expert at configuring the parameters or understand how these algorithms work to be able to use them successfully, this is like an adult coloring book where you actually just draw on the image and the computer figures out how to <laughs> draw on the image in the same behavior. So not only is it more accurate at, at solving the problem and better equipped to handle the challenge, it's also easier for the research to implement this strategy. On the left here, I show a wound healing assay. And just to show off the flexibility, this is not even a single cell application. In fact, we see these two converging cell fronts coming together, and we're actually segmenting the gap in between them to learn something from the kinetics or the rate at which these two things come together. And it's the exact same algorithm that we use to solve the problem that you see in the middle, which is typical cell culture over time as these live cells are dividing, they're changing shape, morphology. Again, that's the phenotypic variability, and it has no issue handling this complexity. It doesn't pick up the false positives and the junk in the background that look quite similar to a cell. They have the same intensity properties or morphology properties, potentially, but it learns from the context, just like our eyes and our brain do. On the right is, it is my favorite example. This is an extremely hard problem. We'll go into more detail on that later. Okay, so again, this is a new module in our image analysis software. And here are some examples that I'll walk you through from interacting and collaborating with our, our different customers in the early days of building this product. So back to the image of the vacuoles. So vacuoles, we probably all know what they are. There's these voids, these gaps, where the cell is upset and is trying to package things up and move them out of the cell. So as I stated before, this is one of my favorite examples of what Synapse can do. And the reason it's one of my favorite examples is we tried making an algorithm to solve this problem that's actually extremely complicated. It's complicated not just because things are out of focus and blurry. We have methods to deal with that. But, but being blurry and out of focus and having this background fluorescence is really a mess when you add on the fact that all the structures, these vacuoles, are at different sizes. And there are other things in the image, like the nucleus, that also excludes the fluorescence. They look very, very, very similar. And when you work with a signal processing method, it doesn't have the context to know the difference between some structure that looks like that and a true vacuole. So it's highly sensitive, it's specific, and robust against false positive detection. The process to create this result was intuitive. It wasn't the user learning how to configure an algorithm to create this result. It was the computer learning what the biologist called a true vacuole versus something else. And it figured out the rest for you. And that makes it accessible. This researcher didn't spend years learning image analysis techniques. Again, I go back to the analogy of an adult coloring book. They simply said, what is a true vacuole? What pixels are not in a vacuole? It figured out the rest. I'll come back to flexibility again, and now I show three examples that are all quite different. On the left is what I'll call bright field analysis. The data is bright field. The analysis is really single cell segmentation. Over time, watching these live cells divide and move around. Um, it's challenging because it's bright field, but again, the point is flexibility. It's the same algorithm, it's the same workflow that generates the result that you see in the middle figure, which is a bread and butter high content screen. This is a cell paint example. It's actually from the data set um, that went into the original publication, where quality control of the information that goes into the downstream stream mach machine learning step that generates these phenotypic profiles is very, very important. And even though the cells are crowded and the data quality is not that great, Synapse is able to figure out how to segment these objects as well as I can by eye. And then something that I'll call a microscopy application. It's not something you see in high content screening. It's from a super resolution image. And it doesn't matter that the content is, is completely different from the other two examples. Again, it's the same workflow and algorithm where if you wanted to study individual mitochondria 
in your data source as an image, it works just as well. And now let's move into what I'll, I'll call a case study. So we, we see that it can do pretty amazing things with respect to segmentation, but the question is, does it matter? So this is an assay where the goal essentially is to count spots. And spot detection algorithms are very subject to false positive detection because being a spot is relative. Um, if you're a bright point around dim pixels, then you could be a spot. But are you a real spot? So I would focus my attention now to the right side of the slide where I just show the pictures. On the top, I show the one, one condition using a conventional segmentation method. On the right, I show um, a treated case, the maximal dose case, where we don't expect to see any spots at all. And you see that we pick up a lot, and that's because the researcher configuring the algorithm optimized it for one condition, which is to pick up spots, and then try to modify the parameters to not detect spots in the maximal dose case. But at some point, if they optimize it too much for the maximal dose case, they start to miss spots in the non-treated case. Take a look at that in contrast when we use Synap that's using context from the entire image as opposed to just local intensity information. So it's doing equally as good job at picking up all the spots um, in the non-treated case, but not subject to the false positive errors that you see in the maximal dose case. And again, if we use our Z prime statistic to say, does it matter? You actually get a drastic improvement in your Z prime score. So it's reliable, it's flexible and accessible. It doesn't require you to be an image analysis expert. It doesn't require you to parameterize things where you're subject to some kind of bias where it's not gonna work well in one treatment. You might get a false positive. You might miss something that's actually really important. You're never gonna know about it. Again, the whole point is to leverage the content in the image and increase the quality of it. And at the end of the day, the extra benefit is it's easy to use. It's one workflow. It's flexible. You can use it against any image analysis problem and maintain the same level of accuracy. So I've described our product that helps with leveraging content, our product that helps with the inputs that goes into that content that you're going to use to make actionable decisions. So when we pair them up, we kind of have an end-to-end -end machine learning workflow. And let's take a look at an example where we put this into practice. So this is recent work with a group out of the University of Michigan where their biological model is candida. And candida live in our guts, evidently, and they typically have a yeast morphology, and that's fine. They can live in our gut and, and we don't have a problem. But they can go through this reversible morphological change into a phenotype that's more elongated. And those more elongated forms are actually problematic. They allow them to infiltrate other tissues in the body and cause infection. So the group wanted to know if we could set up a high content screen that was robust at detecting these phenotypes so that they could go work on environmental conditions, hit it with different drugs, and see if they can modulate the, the natural behavior of the cell type. And again, I would draw probably our attention to the images here. On the left, we have one method, which I'll call a traditional method. We use a signal processing algorithm to segment these cells as best as we can. On the right, we show our deep learning module, Synap, doing the segmentation. The way the experiment was set up is half the wells were all one control, where we expect most of the cells to be yeast. We haven't done anything to them. The other half was set up in a way that we would expect an enrichment of the elongated phenotypes. So there was a, a change in how the, the cells were prepped or cultured. Okay. And if you look at the graphs at the bottom, with the deep learning method, we see exactly that. You see that in the negative control, we have almost exclusively something like 90% um, yeast morphology. And in the what I'll call a positive control, we almost have none of them and we are enriched mostly with the hypha phenotype and some of the pseudohypha. You don't see those same results when you use traditional methods. And it's not because the image is different. The images are the same. Take a look at the image of the segmentation using the traditional method. There's tons of errors there. There's under-segmentation, over-segmentation. 
and detection errors. So if we're completely missing cells, or we're breaking up these elongated cells, or we're merging together cells that are actually two different cells, the features we extract from those segmented objects are no longer going to represent the actual information content in the image. And we get it, we get a graph out of it, we get a result. It's just not very useful, it's not very informative. It's only when we reduce those errors to a certain degree that we actually have a robust assay that's worth using to understand this biological process. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing about our piece of the puzzle on how to make this process of high content screening and this workflow more efficient and more productive using machine learning. I want to turn it over to our friends at Core Life Analytics who have a very interesting product that, that we think you're, you're going to be very excited to hear about. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Hello everyone. My name is David Egan and I'm the CEO of Core Life Analytics. First off, I'd like to thank Will Marshall and all our friends at Cytiva for the opportunity to present here. Core Life Analytics was started by myself and my co-founder, Veen Dumpta, with the goal of solving this problem. If you make even partial use of the capabilities of the Incel and Carta platform, you're going to end up with a lot of numeric data. There's a lot of knowledge in this data, but to extract it, biologists often have to hand it off to data science specialists. This inevitably leads to delays and possibly a suboptimal analysis. The data scientist may not have an in-depth understanding of the complex biologies that are now being used in high content experiments. We have solved this problem by developing a web-based data analytics platform called Stratominer. Stratominer allows biologists to independently mine the numeric data generated by Encarta. It does this by guiding them through an intuitive data mining workflow. They can upload their data, separate metadata from analytical data, discard data that isn't useful, and then carry out quality control. They can now move on to statistical methods such as plate normalization, data transformation, and scaling, and then on to more advanced data reduction methods. The platform allows users to make use of parts or all of the data to generate phenotypic profiles and to investigate these using unsupervised methods or supervised methods such as machine learning. At the end of the day, in the same way that Encarta democratizes advanced image analysis, we're democratizing advanced statistics and data science. Stratominer is a cloud-deployed platform. Each of our customers has their own deployment of Stratominer. They can access this through a, strand, a standard web browser, and of course this is ideal in these days of de-densification when most scientists are only allowed on premises to carry out bench work. The benefits of Stratominer become very obvious to users. It accelerates analysis cycles, reduces the burden on their data science specialists, and most importantly, gives the user far deeper insights into their data. For Incel users, Stratominer completes the high content analysis pipeline allowing them to rapidly turn images into knowledge. In the next section, I want to give you an overview of how that actually works in the Stratominer software. The data from Encarta can be loaded directly into Stratominer without any modification. This can be one plate or a hundred plates. The first thing we do is identify what is metadata and what is your analytical data. We can also give you an opportunity to merge new metadata with your data set. As you will see later, this can be extremely useful. Next, we help you to easily remove useless measurements. Here's an example of something that has useful information. This one doesn't, as it's uniform across the whole experiment. We have a very powerful module that helps you to build and manage plate maps. You can copy, modify, and share them with your colleagues. Now we give you an opportunity to carry out quality control on your data. You get access to a highly interactive plotting technology that we call visual data mining. This is a great place to identify and diagnose problems with your experiment. You can calculate plate metrics such as Z prime and remove outlier wells. All of this I just described is the data wrangling in QC that actually take the most time in data analytics. With Stratominer, however, you can do it in just a few minutes. In the next section of the workflow, we start to get into the data science. The initial part of this will be familiar. We carry out plate normalization against your control wells of choice. 
Then we move on to steps that are suggested if you want to make use of a lot of Encarta measurements for phenotypic analysis. We help you to transform the data to account for heavily skewed measurements like this. We also allow you to scale your data using a z-score or a robust z-score. As I said, however, these steps are optional. If you're doing a simple analysis with one or a few measurements, you can skip them. Next, we move on to dimensionality reduction. This is essential if you're doing real phenotypic analysis with a large number of features. If you're doing, for example, cell painting, you really need to do this. We offer a number of different methods. The most familiar is principal component analysis. One of the most important reasons for carrying out dimensionality reduction is to decrease redundancy in the data. This essentially allows all the phenotypic changes to become visible, even if some are represented by just a small number of measurements. Here's a plot that highlights the similarities between all the measurements in this data set. These yellow blobs are groups of measurements that are saying essentially the same thing. Stratominer, with this scree plot, helps you to figure out how you can reduce this data while still capturing as much of the variance as possible in the reduced data set. What you end up with is a smaller data set with all the important information still there. Another way in which dimensionality reduction helps is by exposing biological connections between different measurements in the data set. You can see how different principal components, for example, are lit up by different types of mechanism of action. Now we get onto the fun stuff. Stratominer can help you to use your reduced data set to identify phenotypic outliers, wells that look different from your negative control, for example, or it can also help you to identify phenosimilars, things that are similar to, for example, a tool compound. We do this by using what we call a distance score. In this 3D plot of the scores from three principal components, you can see how these wells here are far away from the negative controls here. We can calculate this distance, and it's a measure of the strength of the phenotype. This is just shown here in three dimensions, but you can also do this in 11 or n dimensions. Here, we are asking the simple question, what samples are different from our negative controls? You can see that all of our positives are outliers, and in our samples, you can see ones down here that are doing nothing, and then you can see here outliers, things that are phenotypically different. Once we have identified these outliers, we can use hierarchical clustering to separate them according to the profile of the component scores. By doing this, we are separating them by phenotype and potentially by mechanism of action. This combination of distance score and clustering is what we call our unsupervised profiling method. Stratominer also allows you to use artificial intelligence, a supervised method. If you use the cell resolution data from Encarta, you can build machine learning models. Here, Stratominer has built a three-class random forest mo machine learning model to help a user to rank all the wells according to similarity to docetaxel, doxorubicin, and the untreated controls. Stratominer also has a simple app for dose response. This is very useful, especially if you're generating large numbers of dose response curves. As we'll see later, it can also be used in a clever way with phenotypic data. One thing I'd like to make clear is that Stratominer is not just useful for highly complex data, you can also use it for single measurement data such as that from traditional high throughput screens. It's also useful for multiplexing, or you can do something as complex as cell painting. We'll show you with Encarta how adding more advanced methods can help you to get better quality data and more knowledge from the data. It's just the same with Stratominer, so I'd like to show you how we can do this with an Encarta dataset. The example I'm going to use is a publicly available dataset that we know very well at Core Life Analytics. It was originally published by Neil Carrer at the University of Edinburgh. We think of it as cell painting light, as it's three of the five cell painting labels. In this study, cancer-relevant drugs and inhibitors with various mechanisms of action were tested in eight doses. The images from the screen are available at the Broad Institute Bioimage Benchmark Collection, so we asked Will to help us to analyze these images using Encarta. Here I'll show you a subset of that dataset with 30 compounds. The positive control for this screen is the microtubule stabilizer, Taxol. First, let's do a very simple analysis. Let's pretend we're looking for compounds with the same mechanism of action as Taxol. If we look at DMSO images versus Taxol images, there's an obvious difference here. The intensity of the tubulin staining is much higher in the taxol images. 
So let's pick an obvious measure, the total intensity in the tubulin channel for our analysis. But as you can see here, when we plot the negative and positive wells, there is only about a 1.5 times dif difference between the negatives and the Texol wells for this measurement, and the Z prime is only 0.14. Unsurprisingly, if we look at the screen using this metric, it's not too impressive. We pick up microtubule compounds, but we, we would worry if they were real due to the poor Z prime, and there are a bunch of compounds with other mechanisms of action in here. It just doesn't look very trustworthy. Within CARTA, however, we can calculate many more measurements. And in Stratominer, we can use VDMQC to find one that has this higher Z prime. Here's one with a median Z prime of 0.53. So if we look at analysis using this single feature, it looks a lot better to a screener. As well as Taxol, we pick up another Taxane, Docetaxel, and we also pick up another microtubule compound with a very different structure, Epophyllone B. We can still seek compounds with other mechanisms of action, however, so that's still a concern. One of them is Latrunculin B. Let's have a closer look at that. This ha highlights a problem with our better but still simplistic analysis. It's clear from the images that this Latrunculin B gives a very different phenotype to Taxol, but you can see why it still turns up in our hit list. There is intense tubulin staining, but I think we can do better. Let's make use of all the measurements that Encarta can generate at cellular resolution. Now, this is something you're not going to be able to handle in Microsoft Excel. In Stratominer, however, we can use the AI functionality to build a two-class two -class machine learning model, and we can then use this model to rank every well in the experiment according to similarity to Taxol or DMSO. Now, this looks like a very specific assay. We're now identifying hits based on the overall Taxol phenotype, not just one measurement. And you can see that Latrunculin B is now no longer in the hit list. We do still have two confining hits, however, trichostatin, a HDAC inhibitor, and midoxantrone, uh, which is annotated as being involved in DNA replication and damage. A little poking around in the literature, however, shows that there is a reason to believe that they should be there. Trichostatin causes the acetylation of microtubules, and midoxantrone has been shown, also shown to be affect uh, microtubule assembly. So this really demonstrates nicely the advantages of using all the data and more advanced analytical methods. This was a very focused question that we were asking in this example, but we can also use Stratominer in a very exploratory fashion. Here, we use our unsupervised method to calculate the distance scores from the negatives for all wells in the screen. We can plot these distance scores against dose to rapidly identify bioactive compounds. Here you can see the phenotype coming up as the dose increases. And we can then use the clustering functionality to identify interesting phenotypes amongst these bioactives. Finally, we can go back to our plate maps, label interesting wells as new classes for machine learning, and then identify similar wells to these. So in the last few minutes, what I'd like to do is just give you a short demonstration of the Stratominer software itself. So here I am, I can log in to our demo deployment of Stratominer at cla.stratominer.com. So when we log in, then here's the uh, HC Stratominer app, our main app, and here's that app that I mentioned for dose response data. And what we can do is we can jump straight into that experiment that I was showing you uh, in the presentation with the incarded data. And so here, this is where you can access this workflow. And you'll recognize these icons from one of the first slides that I showed. Here is the upload data section. Then we have this very section for dealing with all the metadata, throwing out the garbage. Then here is where we are now, is where we can merge some metadata. So what we've done is we've imported a file that has some external metadata that we can merge with our raw data. Here we have a thing called a reagent class. We have uh, compound names, concentrations, a some sort of corporate identifier, and here's the mechanism of action in a plate ID. And what we do is we actually merge through this plate ID, and we can set that up here, 
then tell the system that we want to use the synonym as a reagent ID, and then the metadata is now merged, and we hit save and continue. So now we move on to that place where we can manage uh, our plate maps. And as I said, we have a very you know, sophisticated module here that allows us to, uh, to modify, uh, copy, share our various uh, plate maps. So in this case, what we have here is we have a number of different plate maps for the same experiment. So the basic plate map looks like this. Okay. But then we also have some additional plate maps like this one for plate number two. And we have some of these wells here that are labeled. So these are some of the compounds that I was talking about earlier on. Here's latrunculin wells, doxorubicin. Then we also have for plate four, we have here some docetaxel uh, wells that are labeled. And once we've added our plate maps, then again, we can move on. And now we're onto this quality control stage that I mentioned, where there's a lot of this visual data mining technology. And so here, by default, what we have is, you know, we can plot uh, these, you know, uh, what we call a, a default feature. And this was uh, that one that gave us a high Z prime and the actual object ID, which is representative of the cell number. And you can see here, we can turn on and off the various reagent classes. Let's, for example, just look at our negatives and our positives. And then we can do things like we can, let's say, remove outliers. Let's say we want to get rid of these guys. Now they've been removed from the analysis. But we can actually still see where they are. We have a new class here called removed. And there we can see the ones that we had removed. And actually, we can even turn them back into samples. Let's say we want to turn these guys back into what they were, we can reset them. Here's that tab where we can uh, calculate our Z primes. Let's see how we do that. And then you can see here how we can sort and sort our features according to the Z prime and figure out which one would be the best if we wanted to do a simple analysis. Then after this, what we could do is I said, move on and do these normalization, transformation, and scaling. But let's jump ahead now, because we've already done that, and let's jump ahead and look at the uh, dimensionality reduction. So first of all, what we can do is we can do this preview step, and this is where we figure out how many principal components we should actually calculate. Here's our correlation plot that shows us the correlation between all the different features. You can see these big blobs of yellow similarity. And then here is that scree plot, and this is the plot that helps us to decide how many components should we calculate. So here, this is indicating that we should probably calculate 11 components, because essentially this is measuring the amount of variance that we're including as we calculate more and more components. Down here, there's no point in calculating any more than 11. So then we can dial in 11 and then actually carry out that data reduction or dimensionality reduction and calculate 11 different uh, principal components. So let's look at these. And here you can see we can flick through each component. And what we can see here are the features or measurements that are loading most significantly on each of the components. And this is what I mentioned is, you know, the biology coming out in the data re reduction. Also, what we can see here is how these various classes that we've defined, how they signal through the various different components. If we look at here, component one, we can see that these labeled uh, wells here, they're latrunculin, they give a very high signal for component one. But if we look at component two, now this one, taxol, seems to be given the highest signal. So now what we can do is we can move on and let's go and have a look at the next step. And again, this is more visual data mining that again allows us to mine the data, but now we can actually have a look at all the various different uh, components. And so here, this is more powerful in that we have various different uh, visualizations that you can plot here. There is a heat map, and then down here we have our 3D scatter plot. So let's look at this, and what we'll do is now we're going to look at the first three principal components.
And now this is where you can see this effect of the distance score. So you can see here are our negative controls, and then you can see the scattering our positives out here, and then you can see these are some of the other compounds that we have labeled. Up here we have the you know litrunculin compounds, down here you have the doxorubicin compounds. So you can see how far away they are from the negatives, and you can see that they are in different areas in three-dimensional space, indicating that they actually have different phenotypes. Now we go to this selection section where we do our hit picking and our profiling. This is this unsupervised method, and so now what we can do is, let's ask a more sophisticated question. Let's see what wells are most similar to doxorubicin. And so what we can do is we can calculate the distance from those doxorubicin wells, and then see what happens there. Now, down here we see our doxorubicin, and then what's over here we can see doxorubicin, doxorubicin, bleomycin, hydroxyurea. So these are other fluxuridine, so these are other DNA damaging agents. And so you can see that they are the ones that are closest to, uh, uh, to doxorubicin. Now, of course, we can do a similar thing using the machine learning. So what we'll do now is let's set up a a three-class model with docetox, docetaxel, doxorubicin, and the negative controls. And now, this let's do the same thing. Let's look for things that are similar to doxorubicin and see if we get something similar. So here's our model. We can see the accuracy is 95%. And then down here, we see the results of it. Here, of course, doxorubicin is high, and then again, we can see phytocholin, bleomycin, our various uh, DNA damaging agents popping up. So, I think this gives you a very nice example of how easy it is to run the analysis in Stratominer, and how you can easily handle larger numbers of features, and then move back and forth in the workflow to get the most information, the most possible knowledge, out of your data. This approach of generating as many measurements as you can and having easy access to advanced methods to mine them gives one major benefit. If you're simply extracting a single measurement from an experiment, you have to iterate over experiments in order to generate new knowledge. With the types of biological systems that are commonly used now, 3D models, patient-derived cell lines, this can get very, very expensive. Within CARTA and Stratominer, however, you can iterate over the analysis. Measure everything that you can at high resolution, and then you can ask multiple questions of the dataset. Stratominer makes this very easy because you can easily jump back and forth within the workflow. New information generated can be merged as new metadata to enrich the analysis. You can also use the information to rapidly refine your image analysis. This is especially valuable in the assay development and piloting stages. If you'd like to know more about the Stratominer platform, you can go to our website, or if you contact us at one of these emails, we'll get back to you. With that, I'd like to thank you all for joining, and I'll hand over to Will Marshall now to uh, wrap up. All right, David, thank you very much for the excellent presentation and a big congratulations uh, to you and your team over at Core Life Analytics on Stratominer, an excellent application that really starts to address those pain points you really feel when doing this type of high dimensional data analysis, especially at scale. So we'll wrap up today with our last slide. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation. We were excited to tell you about our two different software packages and we just want to leave you with the fact that they're very complementary. Both of them are built around the core principle of getting the analysis back in the hands of the people doing the research. And we accomplish this both with intuitive design, where you're interacting with the software, with the skill sets that you have in a very natural way, as well as the new technologies such as machine learning that are really built to handle these types of problems, as opposed to some of the more simplistic image-based analysis that we've been performing over the past few decades. 
If you want more information about our products, you can visit our websites. You can reach out to your local Cytiva representative and they'll be able to point you in the right direction, whether you're looking for just more information or want to get in touch with us about a demonstration in more detail with either of the software packages. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Will and David, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question, uh, this one will go to you, Will. Our first question is, is this HCS tech, is it suitable for digital mammogram images? Uh, yeah, so I, I can take that one. Um, the So high content screening is typically done on cell culture um, in, in a, you know, biological research lab. Um, but the methods to analyze the images, the segmentation approaches, and, and then making sense of the features in the, in the image, that is the same technology you would use for medical images, for example, the, the digital mammogram images. But with high content screening, you, you, wouldn't, um, you wouldn't be taking pictures of people. Um, they're, they're set up to be fluorescent microscopes typically. Um, but the analysis methods, yes, they're the same that, that people use in the medical imaging space. Perfect. Thank you so much, Will, for that. Um, so our next question, um, David, let's hand it over to you. So what library do you use for the MOA information? Um, the, the mechanism of action annotations for that uh experiment actually were in the uh they were in the publication uh so that's where that came from perfect thank you so much for that clarification so it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions but i do want to remind our audience that any questions we're unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration so let's move on to our next question how many images are needed to train a machine learning algorithm for segmentation? And what metric is used to evaluate the segmentation accuracy? Uh, so that's, that's probably for me. So it, it depends. There's, there's not really a, a good answer for how many images. But with something like deep learning, you would expect that typically a lot of data is needed. With, with our product, though, we've, we've provided some pre-trained models. So we've kind of done the heavy lifting where you just need to provide a few examples from your data set to fine tune the network to work optimally on your data. Um, and how we kind of evaluate it, uh, segmentation, there, there's lots of different metrics that people have used in the literature. The intersection over union metric is, is one. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's kind of best assessed in a validation step where you, you have some known um, expected outcome in your data set, and if your analysis gives you that outcome, then, then you infer that your segmentation is good enough. Segmentation itself, I don't think there's a lot of value in, in evaluating just the accuracy, unless you're trying to win a segmentation competition. And maybe, you know, that's a, that's a really good way to think about the workflow that David proposed, where you can use the downstream analysis to infer how you might configure your upstream image analysis. And with things being so fast in StratoMiner to quickly generate a new result, you could quickly iterate between tuning your, or optimizing your segmentation by training it more, and then quickly looking at the end result. Does it get better if you add more images to your training set, for example? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, looks like we have time for, let's squeeze one more question in for you guys. Um, let's take a look. Um, <laughs> All righty. Um, let's go. 
let's go to this one. So, um, David, I believe I believe this one is for you. So, can I use Stratamine R to analyze data from time course experiments? Uh, yes, you can. There's a number of different ways uh, uh, you can do that, but um, what we what we can do with Strataminer is if if you have a column in there that uh, in your data that gives the the time, then you can use this to either uh, run all your data together, or what you can do is you can actually split up the data so that each time point uh, is uh, a separate plate. Uh, and then you can analyze all that in Stratominer and, and uh, treat each time point as a separate place, analyze the data, and then later on uh, take that data and then you can process it and do, um, you know, curves based on time, things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward to run uh, time course experiments. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Will and David for their time today and their important research. We would also like to thank Labberts and our sponsor Citeva for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That's all for now. Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye, everyone.